the, the, the title should really have been The Consequences of, Act of Inaction and, and What Actions You Could Take If You Didn't Want the Consequences. But we couldn't think of a, a quick and easy <laughs> summary, so we thought The Consequences of Action was a suitably grim uh, uh, title. And I want to show you ten slides, no words on them, well, there's w words on one, but basically I just want to give you a flavour of how the biodiversity chapter fits into the rest of the report. The last one of these we did was in 2008, and then, as now, we partnered with uh, PBL, the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. And I want to say right at the outset that, and uh, who is here from, from PBL? Only one person, two people, three people. I want to say without the engagement of these good people, uh, this would have been simply impossible. So our thanks go to them, and they go also, frankly, to the Dutch taxpayer. Uh, this is a major contribution by PBL. Uh, member countries fund our engagement, but this is one single OECD member country that put a lot of money, a lot of resource on the table, and we really appreciate uh, the relationship, and I lose no opportunities to say that because the Dutch government needs to know that it has done a very good thing. So, uh, in 2008, we did an outlook to, two, uh, to, to 2030, and ministers, say, and that was a report which, which was much more sectoral. Uh, there, were, there were a lot of chapters, and with some real uh, foresight, uh, they said, take this out to 2050 for our next meeting, and the ministers meet next week, actually. We meet every once every four years, the ministers. Take it out to 2050 and just focus on four things. Uh, and those four things are climate, uh, water, biodiversity, and human health. And... I think that really was rather inspired because what we have is a much more focused uh, report where you can, un it's not so complex you can't understand important interlinkages. One of the troubles if you try to model everything is that you end up saying the world is so complicated that everything relates to everything else. I think this report really has got a very nice uh, balance and I hope you'll take the opportunity to take a look at it. Now, quickly just running through in a highly schematic way, how this all links together. We start with the, the sources of growth, with population, capital supply, natural resources, which feed through, obviously, into energy use, the two big ones, and land use. And, of course, there are linkages even at that level. And then we're driving through to these four sets of pressures I mentioned. Pressures on health, uh, human health, and the environment through these, the, 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 the mobilization of these resources, of climate change, of water, the stress, the quantity and quality, and biodiversity, and the linkages between these four. And that, when I say that I think this has got a nice balance between complexity and simplicity, that I think is explicable to policymakers. I mean, of course there's more to the world than that, but even that gives you a lot of very, very important linkages. And if there's one message for me that comes out of this report, it is that policymakers simply cannot make policy in separate domains without thinking about the horizontal lines running across those four bottom blocks. You know that. And they will say they know that, but yet we see country by country evidence of incoherences. So if there's an important message, it is that. That is the single thing you should take away from this report. If we do anything to help guide the global policy debate, that's what it will be. Let me just say what our baseline is, because of course this is a modelling exercise. It's not the real world, it's a modelling exercise. It's a what-if exercise. And so we start with a baseline which says what's going to happen to growth um, by 2050 and what's going to happen to the planet uh, on what we know, and this is where the OECD's expertise comes in, uh, in terms of modelling economic growth, given the drivers of population and given the drivers of demand for improved living standards. Now, what we show, what, 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 what our baseline suggests is that we're going to have a world economy, which I'm just building up by, by blocks, that's the OECD, that's the BRICS, that's the rest of the world, which will quadruple in size. So we go from having a $75 trillion global economy to a $300 trillion economy. And 
Uh, there will be many people who say, well, of course, I mean, that's just, that, that's hallucinatory anyhow, and of course, why do you just accept growth in this way? But look, apart from anything else, just about every single politician who's out there in any country in the world, rich or poor, says they want growth. So let's just take them at their word for a moment and say, okay, let's run the growth story. And this exercise does take into account the effect of the, 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 the recent crisis. So, uh, but, but we don't see that as, as, as you know, the world gets over those sorts of crises. Let's take this in purely economic terms, so that gets into the environment for a minute. So, this is, we think, a plausible baseline case in terms of economic growth. And interestingly, we must change the colours on the slide, mustn't we, because it's so hard to see. But that's the US, that white line that's just gone across the screen there. And in our model, the China, on a PPP basis, overtakes the US this year. And there's India for the other big ones. So those are the shares of those countries. But that is the growth uh, projection. And in that baseline case, where no policies change, so it really is hallucinatory, isn't it? I mean, of course there'll be policy change. But on a no policy change basis, we posit a world not just with quadrupled economic uh, output, but it's a world in which energy grows, energy consumption grows by, 80, actually any demand grows by 80%, that fossil fuel still represents 85% of uh, the demand for that fuel in 2050. Uh, it's a world which is 70% urban, and of course it's a world with another 2 billion people. So that is the baseline uh, scenario, and we then run through for each of those four pressures where we think the world ends up, and I, I'll take you through the biodiversity one, but just to make the point that on the climate basis, this is a 685 parts per million world and rising. We are nowhere near a trajectory on current policy to get anywhere near uh, that target, uh, for one thing. Okay, so let's look at the pressures on uh, biodiversity. And what we use uh, here uh, is mean species abundance as our, uh, as our indicator of uh, what progress we are or we aren't making. And as you'd be aware uh, mean species abundance is a measure of the change in populations of species relative to intact or pristine ecosystems. And the, the mean species abundance is distinguished, is determined by the intensity of human pressure according to some predetermined dose-response uh, relationships. Uh, and that's the basis of the modelling. And to date, uh, reduced mean species abundance can be uh, attributed to two main drivers. So we're looking at 2010, we're already way down from 100%, obviously, we're not living on a pristine planet. The two main drivers that have brought us to 2010 are in land use change, and most of that is, of course, needing land for, for cultivation uh, and for livestock, and secondly, from infrastructure um, encroachment and fragmentation. So that's the, the, the human-built landscape and associated bits. And you can see in the baseline, uh, the baseline scenario uh, that mean species abundance uh, declines by about 10%. Just to give you on 2010 how it actually breaks out, uh, there are the bits, uh, as I say in the past, food crop, uh, food cropping and, the, forget that one for a moment, um, uh, pasture for livestock. These are the two big sources of declining uh, mean species abundance, and then we can add to those forestry, we can add uh, abandoned land, which until it sort of gathers strength, sits there representing the costs of previous uh, land use. Uh, nitrogen, uh, this is the, the, the loss of biodiversity from enrichment, um, uh, particularly in freshwater. Climate change already uh, contributing, um, and finally, that other big one, infrastructure, encroachment, and fragmentation. And so carrying, using the model and carrying this forward, this is what happens. And the thing which immediately strikes you is that climate change by 2050 emerges as the, uh, the, 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 the new driving pressure. Climate change starts to overtake some of those direct human drivers. Of course, it's an indirect one coming from, uh, from, from human activity. Forestry is um, another big one there. And on our, our, our um, baseline case, there's a little bit of bioenergy in there, not, not a lot, uh, but there is some bioenergy cutting 
in. So that's, that is, those are the pressures in our baseline um, analysis. Um, so let's just take a little look at forestry, what's happening to, to, to change in forest area, because here's a, you saw that forestry is one of the major pressures. 